So I'm Ernie Hall. I've uh, been a member of, of the uh, Unitarian Universalist Society of Schenectady for 30 years. Uh, they go quickly. Um, uh, it's the only UU congregation I've been a member of. Uh, I was brought up Catholic and uh, was uh, unchurched for a while. And then uh, my family found our way to us and uh, we've been members ever since. Let's begin, we begin by sort of ask, answering the question, why do we want you to know about Unitarian Universalist history and the history of our church? And certainly we could start with the answer that most people don't know much about the history of Unitarian Universalism. There are a lot of misconceptions. For example, some people may think that Unitarian Universalism is a new age religion that somehow popped into existence in the 1970s or something like that. When in truth, Unitarian Universalism can, can trace its roots uh, back to the Christian tradition that began with the life of, life of Jesus. And that's sort of the story we're going to, we're going to tell today. More importantly, I think that it's important to understand that we are part of a religious tradition that goes back a long ways and has been moved forward over the last 600 years by the work of many courageous men and women who have sacrificed much to move us toward a more just world and to develop this religion based on love, freedom, and, so, and social justice. So we, we formalize that in our sources. We call the sources are uh, what, we, what we say that our tradition is based on. And in addition to the direct experience of life, and wisdom from the world's religions and philosophies, <clears throat> we talk about the words and deeds of prophetic people that challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil. And certainly in this day and age, we need to be inspired to continue on with this work. I'm looking at the people who came before us and realizing what a rich tradition we are part of that can often bring strength to do the work of social justice. Two thousand years of history, starting with uh, the beginnings of Christianity, with Christ's life and death and extending all the way to the present day. I'm gonna use this chart to help me tell you this story. This was a chart originally developed by Margaret O'Neill, our minister a few years ago, and used with her permission. And it shows timelines for the history of Unitarianism, of Universalism, and for related historical events. So we're going to start at, at the very beginning. The history will run through the Protestant Reformation and early activities in Europe and then move to the United States. And as you can see from the chart, the two religions developed somewhat independently until finally in rather recent times, 1961, the two religions merged in the Unitarian Universalism. So what we're going to do really is talk about how these religions evolved during the, President, uh, the Protestant Re Reformation from being relatively mainstream Protestant religions, albeit very liberal, to our present day religion, which is creedless, based on love, 
freedom, and social justice. And notice I used the word evolved because that's an important point to make about Unitarian Universalism. That unlike almost all other religions, we do not seek to preserve the teachings of a great book or a great person. But instead, inherent in both Unitarianism and Universalism is the idea that our thinking about religion evolves continuously. And we'll see that, that evolution uh, take place. And is one of the reasons why Darwin is one of our most famous honorees, Darwin being a Unitarian, and we often talk about his insight about evolution because it parallels our own. And probably the first and most fundamental thing we can talk about is, well, where did the words Unitarian and Universalist come from? Well, Unitarian comes from the concept of unity of, and the fact that there is one God. The early Christians, af right after Christ's life and death, were divided as to whether Jesus was God or just human, but a great teacher. And that really wasn't determined until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, when the bishops voted and the Trinity won. And so the church doctrine from that point on was that Jesus was God, there was a Trinity of gods in Christianity. And people who didn't believe that were, heret were heretics. And a heretic was a very bad thing to be in those days. Universalism comes from a much more fundamental understanding, I would say, of Jesus's teachings of radical inclusion, universal love, forgiveness, and compassion, that God is love. All people are loved. All people are deserving of God's love in this particular case. And this was contrary to the idea of hell and eternal punishment. Once again, that was contrary to church doctrine. And so universalism also became a heresy. So after the Council of Nicaea, Unitarianism and Universalism sort of faded into the background. There, was, there were still people who thought about these things, but for the next thousand years, neither of these religions were permitted. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the development of both of these, but we're going to talk about them separately because they did developed separately, but in a related way. And you'll see how they sort of moved along parallel paths until finally the merger occurred not very long ago, 1961. We're going to start with Unitarianism. And we're going to begin our story at the Protestant Reformation. And the person that we want to talk about in the Protestant Reformation is Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus was born about the time that Martin Luther was beginning the Protestant Reformation. He was born in Spain, and Michael Servetus was something of a prodigy. In his teens, he was able to read and write in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and his native Spanish. So he was actually able to read the text of the Bibles in their original languages. And when he did that, he came to the conclusion that much of what Christianity was teaching was not consistent with what was in the original Bibles. And so he proposed a whole new way of thinking about Christianity. He believed that Jesus was a great teacher, but not God. And he felt that what was important 
and what's important to us in, in modern day Unitarian Universalism. He promoted the ideas of the diversity of thought, the use of reason in forming ideas about religion, the toleration of individual belief. And he even went so far as to talk about the nature of God as being that spark of the divine that each of us have within us. He wrote two very popular books on the subject and his message became fairly popular in Western Europe at that, at that time during his life. Although he had to essentially hide because his ideas were so radical that of course, what we now call the Catholic Church were opposed. And of course the Inquisition was going on at the time. So you didn't want to run afoul of the Catholic Church. But also the other Protestant religions were not happy with this message. And so he was in trouble with them as well. So he kept a low profile until finally in 1553, for some reason, he decided to go to Geneva, which is where John Calvin was sort of the religious leader, probably to debate Calvin about, his, about Servetus's ideas. Unfortunately, Calvin had him immediately arrested, put on trial, and condemned to death. And Michael Servetus in 1553 was burned at the stake, and as many of, the, of his books that could be found were also burned. <clears throat> so perhaps we could say our first Unitarian Universalist martyr, if you will. Well, that really freaked out the followers of Servetus, and they felt they had to flee and look for some place to go where there was more religious toleration. And they had heard that, surprisingly, in Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, Romania, and what was then Transylvania, were quite tolerant of diverse religious beliefs. And so Servetus's followers went to Eastern Europe and particularly settled in Transylvania. There, they had an influence on a Lutheran bishop by the name of Francis David or Ferenc David. And he eventually converted to Unitarianism. And he was the court preacher to the king of Transylvania at the time, King John Sigismund. And he convinced the king to pull together a big meeting of all the religious leaders in Transylvania. And at that time, King John proclaimed for the first time in the world, religious freedom for the people in his kingdom. People could choose between Catholicism, uh, Lutheranism, Calvinism, and now Unitarianism. And King John actually converted to Unitarianism, so became the first and only Unitarian king. So there's the answer to two trivia, UU trivia questions. When was the first uh, enactment of religious freedom and who was the one and only uh, Unitarian king? So keep that in mind. Um, unfortunately, soon after all this happened, King John was killed in an accident and the next king was not nearly so liberal and tolerant. And in particular was convinced to abolish what he called religious innovation. Now remember, Unitarianism and Unitarian Universalism is unique, I think, in, in, in the world's religions in that we are constantly seeking new truths, a new understanding to inform our spiritual and religious journey, where most religions fix on a book or a great prophet who founded the religion and keep that dogma 
and protect that dogma. And so the religious innovation ban was aimed directly at the Unitarians. Well, Francis David wouldn't have any of that. He said, no, I'm sorry. Religious innovation, or what we now call the search for truth and meaning, was fundamental to Unitarianism. And he refused to give it up as, as a tenet of Unitarianism. So he was imprisoned and eventually died in prison. But a great def he, great, he greatly defined Unitarianism and was a great defender of, of freedom, the freedom of religion. Well, once again, the Unitarians who were in Transylvania and other places in Eastern Europe felt very unwelcome and felt they had to flee again, this time back to Western Europe, where England and Holland in particular, while not being exactly welcoming or at least tolerant of religious diversity, as long as the uh, sects that were not the primary religion kept it pretty quiet. So for the next 200 years, Unitarianism quietly grew in particularly England. And finally, in I think 1774, the first Unitarian chapel was opened in England. At that time, the most famous minister in England was Joseph Priestley, who, in addition to being a Unitarian minister, was a, was a great chemist, a very famous chemist, a discoverer of oxygen. Um, and he promoted Unitarianism throughout England, but things he, you know, still remember Church of England was not really happy about this. And finally, in 1794, his house and church in England were burned, his family was threatened, and he'd had enough. So he decided, I'm going to go to America. So Joseph Priestley really brought the Unitarian message to America in 1794. Now, prior to, to coming to America, Priestley already had an influence on some of the people we would call founding fathers. For example, Benjamin Franklin attended services at Priestley's church when Franklin was in England prior to the Revolutionary War. Once he got to America, he settled in Philadelphia, which was the center of government for the newly formed country at that time. And he had among his, his occasional congregants, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and was able to really influence his ideas about religious tolerance and freedom um, and use of reason and, and the importance of, of deep thought about religion influence again, the people who we call founding fathers. So if you ever hear anyone say that, you know, think about the founding fathers as, you know, having a more fundamentalist view of religion, it's not exactly true. They, they were actually, most of them were deists and, and they did embrace a, a Unitarian message. So many of the ideas about freedom that are embodied in the founding documents of, of our country, a lot of it was influenced by Unitarian thought. So Unitarianism in the United States grew from a center in Philadelphia from Joseph Priestley's influence. But there was another way that Unitarian, Unitarianism grew in the United States, and it's a fairly surprising way. And it involves what we would call our Pilgrim and Puritan ancestors. If someone asks, whatever happened to the Puritans and Pilgrims? Well, we're part of that, that legacy. You know, when they came to New England, the Pilgrims and Puritans were really interested in religious freedom, but only for themselves, not so much for 
other people. So the only religion that was established by the Pilgrims and Puritans in New England was the congregation, what we now call the Congregationalist religion. And they built churches throughout New England. So Congregationalist was the only religion. Every town had a Congregationalist church, and that was sort of tied in. Uh, the landowners of the town paid an assessment to the church, and they had no choice in this. Well, one of the things we have inherited from the Pilgrims and Puritans is the way we govern ourselves, our so-called polity. And in uh, <clears throat> 1648, the Pilgrims and Puritans got together at a meeting called the Cambridge, and, and they developed what was called the Cambridge Platform, which talks about how their churches would be governed. And what it said was, all churches would be autonomous. And, and we have adopted that polity, and that is true for Unitarian Universalist churches from, from the beginning. Autonomous means we control our own affairs. There is no higher authority. There's no pope. There's no bishop. We control our own affairs. We own our building. We own the land our building is on. We hire our staff. We call our ministers. And we can, you know, within the bounds of the, of the UU principles, sort of define our own focus on religion. Now, we're part of a larger association, but that's voluntary. And we associate freely because there's mutual benefit. We get much from the Unitarian Universalist Association. So in addition to the Cambridge platform, as Unitarian Universalism, sorry, Unitarianism spread throughout the country, many of the Congregationalist churches were influenced by the uh, Unitarian message. And so starting in about 1790, starting with a church in Worcester, Congregationalist churches began converting to Unitarian. And over the next 30 years until 1820, many of the Congregationalist churches converted to Unitarian churches. So many, for example, that by 1820, 125 churches in just in the Boston area had converted to Unitarian, including 20 of the original 25 churches established by the Puritans and Pilgrims after first coming uh, to, to America. So now we have, as we get into the 1800s, we have Boston as a center of Unitarianism and Philadelphia as a center of Unitarianism. So switching to Universalism, the Universalist story is a little simpler. Um, it grew slowly in Europe. Uh, you know, the, the idea of all people being worthy of God's love was a very attractive one, particularly for people who didn't have much in this world. Um, but it really did not grow until it came to the United States. And universalism is very much a United States-based religion. For example, we have uni Unitarian Universalist churches. There are not Unitarian Universalist churches in other places in the world. There are Unitarian churches. Universalism is pretty unique. Even in Canada, there are not universal. It's not a Unitarian Universalist association. It's the uh, it's the Canadian Universalist Council. Uh, <clears throat> so. The story of universalism coming to the United States is an interesting one. It's, it's, it's another odd story where uh, John Murray was a fairly famous universalist preacher um, in England. His wife and child died from the plague. He turned away from God, said, I've had it. 
I'm, I need to start over. He decides to come to America in 1770. His ship gets stuck off the New Jersey shore. He comes ashore and he meets a person named Thomas Potter, who has built a chapel on his farm land and is awaiting the arrival of a, of a preacher. And he manages to convince John Murray to come and preach in Potter's Chapel, which is still there uh, in New Jersey in a place called Murray Grove. Um, he preaches for three years, and then the Gloucester, Massachusetts Universalists call him to come to Gloucester, which he does in 17, in, in, um, 1773. Now, the Gloucester Church, remember all the churches in New England were Congregationalists. In 1773, 74, the Gloucester Church appeals to the Massachusetts Supreme Court and says, we want to be able to establish a church in Gloucester and we want most, you know, the Congregationalists of Gloucester want to become uni Universalists. And they win that case. And that's really the first example of religious freedom in New England. And that opens the door for, remember I said, the Unitarians starting in 1785 with Worcester, many, many of the Congregationalist churches converted to Unitarian. Same thing happens. Many of the Congregational churches convert to Universalist. And it all started with this one case in the Massachusetts Supreme Court. So we owe it to the, uh, to the Universalists in this case to promote religious freedom, particularly in, in New England. Um, one important additional note about John Murray, who lived a long life and really established Universalism in, in New England and throughout the eastern part of the United States is that um, he, through a series of events, ends up marrying Judith Sargent Stevens, uh, part, of, part of the famous family from Gloucester. And she becomes the DRE, the Director of Religious Education for the Gloucester Church. Judith Sargent Stevens is a, is a feminist at a time when that's a very new concept. She publishes a catechism that for children that promotes the equality of boys and girls, men and women, and publishes many essays and books um, about feminism. So one of the very earliest voices for the equality of women, and this is a, a common theme in universalism. Remember, if, if you believe in universal love, then you believe that everyone is universally equal. So the un universalists are always ahead of the other religions, including Unitarianism, in promoting the equality of all people and working, for example, for uh, the equality of people of color, the equality of women, the and then later on, the equality of, of for example, LGBTQ people. So the universal love of universalists directly translates into working in the social justice area for equality of everyone. Well, after his time in Gloucester, John Murray moves to Boston. So Boston now becomes the center of thought for both Unitarianism and Universalism. And for the next 50 years or so, there are many famous ministers in Boston that we look back on as sort of defining American Unitarianism and Universalism. William Ellery Channing is a famous um, American Unitarian minister um, and defined sort of classic American Unitarianism. He was sort of a more conservative person, not my particularly favorite minister, but but 
a giant among uh, uh, Unitarian ministers. Um, Theodore Parker, who, who was a little bit later than Channing, who is one of my favorite ministers, was much more liberal and started to pull social justice into the whole concept of what a religion should be about. He worked tirelessly uh, for causes such as uh, abolition of slavery, um, the end of the death penalty, uh, and other social justice um, causes. Uh, he was very active in the Underground Railroad. Uh, and as a matter of fact, is famous for having kept a loaded gun in his desk because he was never sure exactly if and when people from the South hunting slaves would descend upon his church because of its activity in the Underground Railroad. He was also the person you may know coined the very famous phrase that Martin Luther King used and Barack Obama used and we now use quite a bit and that is that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends toward justice. So a great voice for, for early Unitarianism. And Hosea Ballou uh, was a giant among Universalist ministers and really to the course of his um, ministry also adopted a Unitarian, you know, Jesus is fully human type of, of message. Um, so really was one of the first people to preach a Unitarian Universalist message. He's recognized as the founder of, of Tufts University and really represents sort of the pinnacle of, of uh, Unitarian Universalist thought. So Unitarianism and Universalism are sort of, by the middle of the 1800s, well entrenched in, in America, but with a fairly uh, traditional Christian view of, of religion. Well, that is turned completely upside down by the transcendentalists who are adopted into the Unitarian uh, religion. And the main proponent there is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Transcendentalism talks about religion as being a vital personal experience. It de-emphasizes churches and holy books and those types of things and talks about using your own senses, talks about trying to understand the world and the nature of, of life and spirituality through direct experience. You know, think of, think of Henry Thoreau out at Walden Pond. That's the classic transcendentalist experience. You can imagine how that turns traditional religion upside down. And in fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson went and preached a sermon. He was a, he's a minister preached a sermon at uh, uh, Harvard Divinity School, the center of Unitarian thought, religious thought. It so scandalized everyone at Harvard Divinity School that they didn't invite him back for another 30 years. But transcendentalism begins to slowly become a very popular trend in Unitarianism. And it's promoted primarily through a magazine, which becomes the most read uh, publication uh, of for Unitarians in the country, a magazine, a transcendentalist magazine called The Dial. And Ralph Aldo Emerson hires Margaret Fuller to be the editor of The Dial. Fuller is again a proponent of women's rights and women's equality, and in particular publishes in 1845 the book women in the 19th century, which really defined and started the women's rights movement, which then came together in Seneca Falls in 1848 and led to the women's suffrage movement that was centered in, in Seneca Falls here in, in New York State. So again, about what, 70 years later, 
than than Judas Sergeant Stevens, but still, the Unitarians catch up in the in the whole area of, of women's rights uh, and uh, you know women's equality. Well, another important factor that goes into the uh, ascendance of women in Unitarianism and Universalism comes about because of the Civil War. You know, in the Civil War, twice as many soldiers died from unsanitary conditions in the camps and hospitals than in the battlefield. And so uh, President Lincoln started what was called the Sanitary Commission, the precursor to the Red Cross, to improve those conditions. And many Unitarian and Universalist women worked for the Sanitary Commission during the Civil War People like Julia Ward Howe, Dorothea Dix, Mary Livermore, and Clara Barton. And then when the war ended, they were really excited about doing this type of work, did not want to return to the home. And so got very involved in things like women's suffrage and health care, mental health, health care in general. Clara Barton founds the, the Red Cross, Dorothea Dix works tirelessly to improve the treatment of people um, in mental hospitals. At the same time, the movement to ordain women in both universalism and Unitarianism grows after the, after the war. And historic, the, the historical record is a little foggy here, uh, but we believe that Olympia Brown was the first woman ordained uh, as a universalist minister at, at the St. Lawrence Theological School up in northern uh, New York. And Antoinette Louisa Brown, no relation, was ordained by the uh, Unitarians in 1878. By 1920, the year that women got the right to vote, there were 88 universalist women ministers by far the most of any religious denomination. And in second place were the Unitarians with 42 women ministers. So there's a very, very long history of, of uh, women leaders in our, uh, in our religious movements. Another very important historical event connected to Unitarianism and universal, Unitarianism in particular was the publication of Charles Darwin's treatise on evolution in 1861. Darwin was a Unitarian and Unitarians embraced the idea of evolution. After all, we are, Unitarianism is a religion founded on evolution, the evolution of thought, religious innovation, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, while many other religions reject and demonize evolution. And I guess that continues to this day. But Darwin is seen as, as something of a, of a great uh, prophetic voice for, for Unitarian and, and Universalism. Uh, and certainly, again, you know, reinforced the conviction that, that Unitarians in particular had that one needs to continue to evolve in order to thrive and grow. Uh, and so all this begins to fit together uh, for uh, Unitarians. So as we evolve and grow, the next big uh, force in our religious evolution is humanism. And that particularly comes into play at the beginning of the 1900s, much of it um, as a reaction to the horrors of the First World War and the idea that if there is a God, how could how could a, a loving God allow uh, 
that kind of horror to p take place on such a such a global scale. So many uh, Unitarians and Universalists turn to a, a humanistic view of religion and spirituality, a humanistic view that says we cannot rely on prayer and a divine being to make things right in the world. As, as people, we need to work to make things right in the world, to promote social justice. And it's, it's really up to us, if not us, who? So humanism really, again, takes root in American Unitarianism and Universalism in the beginnings of the 20th century. And John Haynes Holmes and Clarence Skinner are probably the leading proponents of a humanistic philosophy. They are, sign they are writers and signers of the Humanist Man Manifesto, which is published in 1933. And in fact, of the 34 uh, original signers of the Humanist Manif Manifesto, 14 of them are either Unitarian or Universalist ministers. John Haynes Holmes and Clarence Skinner worked to found the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the American Civil Liberties Union. So great liberal thinkers, great liberal social campaigners, and promoted the social gospel as something of a reaction to what was called social Darwinism. The, you know, sort of the, the corruption of Darwinism is to say that, you know, survival of the fittest also applies to human beings and, and people as well. And we don't need to, you know, support those in, in need, you know, survival of the fittest would say, you know, natural selection will decide. The social gospel takes the exact opposite view that says that we have a duty to help everyone and, and particularly ever, anyone who has need. And so again, as, as a humanist philosophy, they are great proponents of this, of this uh, idea that still is, is critically important in Unitarian Universalism. So here we are in, oh, I, I should also, I'll, I'll mention more about this in a, in a few, when we talk about the Schenectady Congregation, but the Schenectady Congregation was one of the very earliest humanist-based UU congregations in the country. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in the 1920s, or so we have Unitarianism and Universalism well established in the United States. It, it's been affected, both Unitarianism in particular has been affected by Transcendentalism, which talks about a personal search for, for truth and meaning, and also humanism which talks about our need to help one another. Um, at the time, universalism, Unitarianism is actually thriving. Universalism, not so much so. They're, after the death of their famous preachers, such as Hosea Ballou, they began to taper off. And so they're looking for some way to revitalize themselves Unitarians and Universalists are growing closer in their ideas about religion. And as early as 1931, there are talks about merger. And like many things, it takes a long time. <laughs> and uh, the first thing to come together are the youth and RE programs. Uh, the term liberal religious youth was a, a term that defined a lot of the um, 
youth and RE programs in the 1950s, which were both Unitarian and Universalist. Finally, after many uh, negotiations, the, there was a meeting in 1959 right in Syracuse, which happened to have a very strong Universalist congregation and a very strong Unitarian congregation. And I think the idea was if if they could work it out, then everybody else could work it out as well. So the agreement was worked out in Syracuse in 1959, and, and the merger takes place in 1961. And that begins Unitarian Universalism. Uh, Reverend Dana Greeley, who was head of the um, uh, American Unitarian Association, becomes the first president of the UUA. Probably the most important event in the life of the new religion, Unitarian Universalism, comes just four years later in Selma, when Martin Luther King is, is conducting marches for voting rights and uh, equal rights. And the first march is a failure. There, as you, I'm sure mo you all know, they are, the marchers are beaten, they're turned back. Martin Luther King issues a call, particularly to Unitarian Universalists, to come help. And 200 UU ministers and thousands of lay UUs from throughout the country go to Selma. And it really becomes the crowning moment, the defining moment for the new Unitarian Universalist faith. Unfortunately, of the three people who were killed associated with those marches, two were Unitarian Universalists, James Reeb, a minister, and Leola Luzo from Chicago were both, were both set upon and, and killed. And during that time, the black membership in UU congregations actually grew very significantly. So there was an immediate response to um, this, this event. As the 1960s went on and into the 1970s, the social unrest that was tearing the country apart also had an effect on Unitarian Universalist congregations. Movements such as women's rights, black empowerment, anti-Vietnam war, free love, and LGBT anti-discrimination all became very important issues within UU congregations. And we had some triumphs and we had some failures. For example, the anti-war movement tore apart many congregations, which sort of mirrored the country as a whole, but congregations had people who were in favor of the war and those who were opposed, and it was a difficult time. The black empowerment or civil rights movement, we had a major misstep there where promises were made to support black, black churches and black uh, causes. And unfortunately, the association ran out of money, was not able to fulfill those promises. And many of the people of color who joined UU congregations in the mid 60s ended up leaving, feeling that we didn't fulfill our promises and that, that they were very disappointed. It was just another group of white people who, who weren't going to do what they said they were going to do. We had much more success, perhaps learning from that experience with promoting LGBT anti-discrimination uh, and in particular, uh, marriage equality. And uh, the story with, with um, LGBT rights 
has been one of of steady progress uh, as opposed to uh, the progress of of incorporating people of color and being anti anti racist, which has been a much bumpier bumpier road for us. And uh, in nineteen, it was really just nineteen seventy nine that the first um, LGBT minister was called to a Unitarian Universalist congregation. That was a um, a long time coming, but uh, uh, there was st there were still, I think, difficulties in in uh, LGBT people feeling they could have a successful ministry uh, in even in Unitarian Universalist churches, uh, and that's almost hard to believe at this point. Uh, but that was that was certainly true. Um, in, all the way into the 1990s. And we can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, so now we have a Unitarian Universalist religion, as you all know, that is, is really focused on a number of things, social justice, outreach, spiritual deepening, um, the Green Sanctuary Program for congregations to uh, work on climate justice started in 1989. Partner Church Council, which reestablished our ties with the Transylvanian Unitarians, uh, re-emerged in 1989. It had existed earlier in the early 1900s. Um, the UUA General Assembly supported full marriage equality in 1996. And UUA President Bill Sinkford performed the first U.S. same-sex marriage on the day that the Massachusetts Supreme Court in 2004 affirmed marriage equality. And then starting around the year 2000, congregations became very interested in, in um, spiritual deepening programs such as Covenant Circles and Wellspring, looking you know, to move, in, and here we're still evolving, move perhaps beyond humanism into a, a deeper uh, understanding of the imp most important questions, you know, in our lives. And at the present day, as you again know, our organization side with love, champions the marginalized and the oppressed, uh, particularly uh, immigration, uh, right now, immigration issues. Wellspring is really the center of our spiritual deepening program. There are new efforts to uh, understand uh, anti-racism uh, and to explore and dismantle white supremacy culture. The organization Black Lives of UU has been well-funded and is working very hard to bring people of color into Unitarian Universalism. Climate justice is, is uh, uh, very important to almost all UU congregations. We have finally elected our first uh, female UUA president. And last year, UU The Vote was a tremendously positive and, and important force in our, in our UU congregations. Sort of a quick summary of where we are now. Um, 